natural disaster, conflict, social instability, disease and climate change all lead to one thing, hunger. This week, we look at food shortage in Sub-Saharan Africa. Our elders talked about desert locusts. And how COVID-19 is making it worse. We also ask, could urban farming be a solution? And what are the benefits of indigenous vegetables? Around the world, COVID-19 is said to radically exacerbate food insecurity. This year, the World Food Program, a United Nations agency, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for its effort in combating hunger. Upon receiving the award, the World Food Program Executive Director David Basley says it's a call to action. It's a call to action to our donors around the world, to the billionaires who are making billions off of COVID. It's a call to action to not let anyone die from starvation. It's a call to action that we've got to save and help our, our friends, our brothers, our sisters around the world. With all the wealth in the world today, no one should go to bed hungry, much less starve to death. The coronavirus pandemic is increasing poverty and hunger for many in 2020, according to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. In Africa, conflict and climate change are making an already dire situation even worse. VOA's Mariama Diallo reports. The UN's Food and Agricultural Organization says its efforts to fight hunger have been set back 10 years due to the coronavirus pandemic. FAO's chief economist, Maximo Torreiro Collins, says the problem is not a lack of food, but access to it. People won't have access to food because they are losing their jobs, because they don't have the income. Developing countries will be facing significant challenges because of recession in the world. Uh, and, and therefore, that is what explains why undernourishment could increase to 132 million and, and poverty. He predicts poverty will get worse. We are expecting an increase in, in poverty, which goes up to 150 million more people moving into extreme poverty. We are expecting 132, up to 132 million people moving to undernourishment. The most vulnerable, he says, are those exposed to unrest or climate change. In sub-Saharan Africa, in the Sahel area, uh, most of them were already facing conflict. Most of them were already facing huge shocks of climate. Uh, or they were facing locust, the, the problem that we have in, 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 in Eastern Africa. East Africa saw a devastating outbreak of locust swarms this year. In Kenya, it was the worst plague of the voracious insects in 70 years, taking a toll on the livelihood of millions. Although the pandemic has hit other parts of the world harder, such as in the United States and Europe, a survey by the International Committee of the Red Cross found that respondents in Africa have been affected since the start of the pandemic. ICRC's Alimatu Amadou spoke to VOA from Dakar. And this survey was done among 2,400 people in 10 African countries. Um, and what those people we have interviewed say is, is really a worry. For example, 94% have told us that um, the prices of the food has increased in their local markets. Uh, we also see that 82% of the people interviewed said that they lost income or revenue. She says only 7% of the people said they had enough savings to cope with the current situation. Beyond Africa, the FAO is particularly worried about Latin America, which has also been hit hard by COVID-19. Numerous studies in recent years have shown that the climate change is putting the world's food supply at risk. In Nigeria, since 2012, flooding has regularly wreaked havoc on the most populous country in Africa. Experts are blaming climate change and poor urban planning as primary factors for the problems. VOA Ifyokiteng reports that farmers in Nigeria have lost 25% of the country's projected harvest due to flooding. The United Nations warns that Nigeria stands at risk of famine and food insecurity. Let's take a look. Ibrahim Abdullahi is looking at what remains of his 350 hectare rice farm in Nigeria's Kebi state. Abdullahi was expecting to harvest 300 tons of rice, but weeks of severe flooding means he'll be lucky to get 100. Since when I started farming, 
I have not experienced, experienced intensive cultivation of rice as now. But unfortunately, 90% of our farmers, they have lost what they have cultivated. Nigeria's biggest rice producing state, Kebi, had projected 2.5 million tons this year. But heavy September rains washed away 2 million tons, which could cause a further jump in the price of the grain. If rain have already washed away all the farm product, you know the goose will be rising up. Are you hearing me? Because a little one that they have on the ground, they will make sure that they recover the one that the, the, washer, the water moves away. So that they will double the price. With Africa's largest population, Nigeria annually imports billions of dollars of rice and wheat, but hopes to become self-sufficient. Last year, Nigeria closed land border imports to crack down on smuggling and boost local rice production. Despite the lost rice, Nigerian officials say the ban will remain in place and affected farmers will be compensated. The government and even the financial institutions have put a, uh, a missionary in force. So many who have lost now are already preparing for the dry season farming. And that is where the synergy should. Nigeria's Farmers Association say better ground work is needed to capture rains so that they can prevent flooding and have a steady water supply during the dry season. Flood reduction will also help save homes and the displacement of thousands of Nigerians from overflowing rivers. If you're Ketang, for VOA News, Argungu, Nigeria. That's indeed an unfortunate story. Let's look at another example. Global warming could increase both the number and appetite of insect pests which are posing a serious threat to crop production. Since 2019, parts of Kenya have been under siege by swarms of locusts. The number of the flying insects are the highest in recent memory. Farmers in impoverished regions are struggling to shield crops from hungry locusts. VOA Arashab Arabasadi has the report. Farmers in Turkana, Kenya face an existential crisis. For much of the past year, out-of-control swarms of locusts have rampaged through this impoverished region, eating fields of crops and leaving little to sell or feed the farm animals. Our elders talked about desert locusts, but this is the first time I've seen them. A mother of seven, Anna Amarai, says locusts deprive animals of the food they need to produce the milk she serves to her family. It takes several days, and we add water to the milk to make enough for the children. Locusts have so far eaten as much as 20 percent of the crops in this region, prompting the UN Food and Agriculture Organization to train local youth to monitor and report on locust migrations. Pastor and local livestock organization member Moses Arang cautiously puts hope in faith. I know if the desert locusts disappear and God gives us a little bit of rain, the pasture will return. But if it doesn't rain for a month and the hoppers finish the pasture, the livestock will suffer and die from hunger and disease. Local agriculture officials say farmers alone cannot solve the locust infestation. They're calling for aid from the government and nonprofit groups. If more isn't done and fast, experts say, the people in East Africa could face food insecurity by December. We reached out to Maureen Mokeda, a nutritionist in Kenya and a founder of the food security organization Tule Viema. Mokeda says regarding the locust infection, the government should have done more. And beside climate change, gender inequality is another main factor causing food insecurity in recent years. Another cause of food insecurity in sub-Saharan Africa is um, gender inequality. There is increasing evidence that is showing that um, when women have uh, or are given the opportunity and the platform to develop themselves, and there's a recent study that was done in Kenya and it showed that nearly over 50% of the land owned in Kenya is by men, yet um, it's women who cultivate this land. So if we are able to bridge the gender parity um, gap, 
we where we'll be able to empower women and to keep them with skills and even basic education of how um what proper nutrition entails because food insecurity is not only about availability of food but also access and um utilization of this food so once women and also the general population understand what proper nutrition is uh, we'll be able to um uh, address food insecurity that's Maureen Mukeda, a nutritionist in Kenya, and she has a lot more to share with us later in the program. Please join us on our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our handle is at VOAR Voices. You can reach us also on WhatsApp. Our number is right there on your screen. After the break, we'll let you know how urban farming is rising up as a solution for food insecurity during the pandemic. Stay with us. <music> is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues it's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard because our lived experiences our stories and our voices will help shape the next generation welcome back you're with our voices this week, we are focusing on one thing near and dear to our hearts and our well-being, food. COVID-19 is taking a toll on food security. We may be seeing a solution and it could possibly reshape the food supply chain. In March, the country went into lockdown, which caused individuals to lose their jobs, which affected their livelihood. In Freigrund, a community based in Cape Town, hunger was a real concern at the onset of the lockdown. Fortunately for some, individuals and organizations came together to attend to the need of the community. My name is Nolu Babalo Polana. We started a movement called Freigrund United for Change, which is now known as Paza Hub. Um, we started feeding schemes and community kitchens in Freyhond. Nolu Babalo says she saw a need to step in for her community. I think it was mostly it was just the high unemployment rate. I think we close to 80%. So we established those uh, kitchens which will serve um, immune boosting food and we will source our veggies from small scale farmers from Fort Lozar. She explains how the project tried to solve the problem of food security in Freigrund through community kitchens. We know our area, how it is, like how we started our mapping of where we put the kitchen in, kitchens in. We first said, oh, let's do food parcels, you know, but then we saw it's not going to work because almost every household is in need. The government is not accessible and corruption because whenever I called and asked, I would be told, oh, no. We already sent two trucks of food and like, but no one received anything, mm. you know. Uh, so then when we went to like site visits, we'll see like where we are, Chris Lynn's kitchen. She has a garage so she can open and dish up and has an open space inside. And some people can cook, but then they'll walk like a very visible space where people can see. Mm -hmm. Then they'll dish up there for anyone that just wants food. Each kitchen, more or less... Nolu Babalo says Freigrund United for Change used to operate 14 kitchens in the community and each one of them feeds roughly 150 people every day. Due to budget cuts, only eight remain, but more people are in need than ever. In order to achieve their goals, Freigrund partnered with Foodflow, who supplied fresh produce for the Freigrund kitchens. So as soon as uh, restaurants and schools shut down in South Africa, um, a friend of mine who's a farmer herself realized that there was going to be a real need for farmers that still had food growing but now had nowhere to deliver it to. So she had the idea of redirecting this food into the communities that were really going to need it during this time. The project has even helped farmers stay afloat during the pandemic. Most of the time, the best markets are outside of this area. So we end up taking all of this organic, nutritious vegetables and sending it out of the community. And Food Flow gave us the opportunity to literally connect to schools and um, soup kitchens in our own area. 
and make sure that that produce is going where it's needed the most during this time when people are losing jobs, losing incomes. Moving forward, the project is intended to keep going with kitchens that will remain open even after the lockdown. What a promising story. And we are lucky to talk to Ashley Noel, the co-founder of Food Flow, to learn more about this collaboration. Food Flow was started in the beginning of COVID-19 arriving in South Africa when a friend of mine, Iming Lin, who's a small scale farmer, realized that as restaurants closed, she was losing all of her restaurant clients and many other farmers would be in the same position. And at the same time, schools and aftercare facilities were closing, which meant many communities that rely on these facilities for important meals wouldn't have the same access. And so we began um, supporting small scale farmers and fishers, and we were introduced to Freiground United for Change through the organization Takano, which has enabled us every week to bring in deliveries of fresh vegetables and fresh fish um, grown and caught by local small scale producers. And this is our way of encouraging people in times of both crisis and normal times to think about not only where their food comes from, but who their food comes from. And one of the partners that we work with is Abalobi, um, who does a, a really unique job of connecting people with the story behind their food. My name is Daniel Smith. I'm the Marketplace Engagement uh, Manager for Abalobi. And as Ashley said, it, it was incredible to have this traceability system that we've built, generally targeting the high-end restaurants and, and individual consumers now, but, but where the full story behind that fish that was caught um, in the coastal communities, in generally rural coastal communities along the coast of South Africa. And, and the importance there is, is that that QR code travels with the fish and you're able to scan that QR code and understand a little bit more about who caught the fish. You can see the fish's face. You can understand a bit more about the, the context of where that fisher actually comes from and, and really yeah, get to know that fisher. There's an ability to also send a text message, so really to connect with the producer, um, in this case the fisher, to say thank you and, and show appreciation for your catch. As Sudan goes through the third month of COVID-19 lockdown, a new trend is growing in the capital of Khartoum as people turn to home gardens to stay productive and healthy. And social media plays an important role in spreading the knowledge during the lockdown. Alamin Jafar, an information technology engineer in Khartoum, has found his passion in agriculture. Through his Facebook group, Jafar is encouraging people to garden at home to stay productive and healthy. The Facebook group called Azibia Sudani, or a skilled Sudanese farmer in Arabic, helps people grow their own food. Information about agriculture should be available for free to help people garden at home. Without the information, people will not know how to garden in an efficient and cost-effective way. People are already growing and farming to reduce the consumption fees. Without the information, they'll prefer buying from the market despite the issues of the non-organic products. The Facebook group's membership has grown sevenfold during the pandemic to about 350,000 followers. With the help of experts and his own family, Jafar is gathering and delivering the best seats available to motivate beginners to get started. Since the lockdown, gardening shops have become more popular, giving customers more plant options. Shop owners say fruit saplings and aloe vera plants are the most popular. Group member Faris Karor began planting flowers and aloe vera. Now he's growing vegetables too. I was using the roof to plant shadow plants and normal flowers. After the quarantine started and the popularity of Alziri Asudani group, it was so useful to me. I changed the roof spaces to other agricultural products like vegetables. I have already harvested them now. Experts say the home agriculture trend is helping people deal with issues related to the pandemic. People who are practicing agriculture and are interested in it feel more relieved from the stress and tension due to the coronavirus. It is also increasing the feeling of security as people are having agriculture products being produced in their homes. Sudanese authorities recently loosened lockdown measures meant to control the virus. It's unclear if the home gardening trend will continue to grow. Naba Muhyiddin for VA News, Khartoum.
For more insights on urban farming, we talk to Dr. Aston Gumby, Assistant Professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, about the benefits of growing vegetables at home and how the process can be made more accessible just in case you haven't already started. Most of the time before COVID-19, we all, I think, they're, you know, we are so like disjointed from just the food we eat mm -hmm. and because we took it for granted that, yeah, you can easily just go to the grocery store mm -hmm. and get it. It's always going to be on the shelf. But then realizing that, no, if I go to the grocery store, it is not there. Mm -hmm. All the shelves that they started running dry. And then we're like, okay, start. you start to panic and like, oh, okay, yeah. how do I grow the kale? That because I'm used to eating kale for lunch. I'm used to eating a tomato. So how do I now grow it? So, so that winky. to me was like, yes. People around the world almost simultaneously um, turned into this direction. Could you tell us on what your study found on a global scale? So yes, I, I think what the study showed is that everybody actually turned into growing their food and realizing that actually we do not have to rely on going to the grocery stores. We can start producing. And you guess what? That food you produce, first of all, is healthy. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's helping our mother heart because right now, you know, the climate change crisis. Mm -hmm. So the more many of us grow food, much better it is for our environment. And then also lastly, you know how you grew your food. So you know that you've not put a lot of pesticides. You know the soil where you're growing it from. You know even the water that you're using to grow the food. So it's it's healthy, it's nutritious, it's good for our climate as well, and it's good for all of us. Uh, with all the benefits of our urban farming, how do we uh, more efficiently introduce urban farming to city dwellers and build a sustainable system? So that's a very good question. First of all, I think there has to be a buy-in, a buy-in from uh, the governments mostly or the city councils. If we really need a sustainable way, because definitely, of course, you will need all these amenities, infrastructure to make it happen. Ministry of Agriculture can really take a big lead. And so, for example, I think in Nairobi, it's already beginning to happen. I think the other day I was reading one of uh, the permanent secretaries in agriculture, Minister of Agriculture, is actually uh, introducing urban farming. They are finally embracing it. And so they have a demonstration, I believe, place where they are showing off what is urban gardening and the many forms of urban gardening that can happen. So once we have that embracement by our leaders, by our city councils, and set aside areas, I mean, think of like, for example, Nairobi, we have the park gardens, set aside these urban areas that can be accessed by farmers and they can come and that's another way. And then, of course, as we finance this, I know that MasterCard Foundation, for example, is a believer in urban farming. I've seen them actually funding young people and young uh, youth organizations that do actually work on urban farming. So when we have that government buying, NGOs and private sector, and then, of course, we need the universities because we need a lot of research and development into this mm -hmm. so that at least People that jump into it, they know how to do it and do it well. If I live in a city and have some space in my home, even if it's just a balcony, and would like to try growing some crops at my home, how do I start and what should I start trying to grow? So that's a good question. So I think, you know, in the balcony, for example, it's it's, it's a small space and I'm not right now looking at my own balcony. And yeah, you can grow a lot. First of all, you can grow kale or skooma wiki. You can grow tomatoes. You can grow bell peppers. And so all you need is to find access to soil or even add hydroponics. So there are different ways when you think about urban gardening. The beauty is there are different forms of farming. So you can go hydroponic, which means it's just you're using water and giving water that nutrients that the soil that come from the soil. Mm -hmm. You can also get some soil and mix it with manure and do some bug garden, gardening as well. You can use, you can really get innovative. Take, for example, any container that you don't use, fill it with soil and get it out and grow. And then you can stack it up. You know, when you think about the stacked crates and I think, you know, get creative. I mean, I've seen, you can even have shelves. You can build shelves and 
put all your containers, you know. And green is beautiful. I, I love green. It's edible. It's beautiful. Instead of just, yeah, flowers are important, but I think flowers that you can eat, it will be wonderful. We will have to take a quick break. Coming up, Maureen Mukeda is back to give us some tips on what to grow in our backyard and how to eat healthy during the pandemic. We'll be right back. Welcome back, you with our voices. Maureen Mukeda, the founder of Tule Viema, Eat Well in Swahili, is back with us for more tips. Her organization has helped hundreds of households become more food secure. Mukeda shared with us four vegetables that are both nutritious and easy to grow at home, and best of all, how to cook them right. So the indigenous vegetables that we train them to cultivate are cow peas, African nightshade, amaranth, and spider plant. These indigenous vegetables are very rich in iron, which is a nutrient of concern among our age group, the women we work with, so which prevents anemia and consequently improved birth outcomes. Apart from iron, they're also very rich in fiber. So through consumption of um fiber-rich foods and foods that are not high in fat, um, not high in sugar or salt, we are able to prevent these diseases. And also, the indigenous vegetables have a, very, um, a short maturation period. They do not take long to mature. They also uh, are disease and pest resistant, so they are not attacked by, they are not easily attacked by diseases and pests. And also, taking care or tending to these indigenous vegetables on the vertical gardens is it's not labor intensive so this means um the young women are able to go and look for casual jobs to supplement so the best way to cook uh, indigenous vegetables is through frying or light frying just by use of very little oil and um this is because uh Vegetables have um, water-soluble vitamins. So use, when you prepare the vegetables through boiling, um, there's a very high risk of losing excess um, the excess nutrients. Remember, these vegetables need to be washed. Um, and so even through the process of washing, since they, they have water-soluble vitamins, we are losing some nutrients. So we fry them lightly with very little oil so that you ensure do not lose the vegetables both um, when you're washing and you're also cooking that's all for us this week folks we hope that some of you got inspired and will try to grow some plants at home meanwhile eat healthy stay strong thank you for watching our voices have a good day mm -hmm.